Do you ever feel like your life has turned into something you never intended? I'm worried about you. Are you sleeping? You scared me the last time we talked. You know me. I never sleep. My ex-husband used to call me a nocturnal animal. I didn't know you had an ex-husband. I've been thinking about him a lot lately. And then recently, he sent me this book that he's written. It's violent and it's sad. And he dedicated it to me. Did you love him? I did something horrible to him. What are we going to do? It's a question of how serious you are about seeing justice done. someone you have to be careful with it you might never get it again it's fun to kill people we should try it sometime <laughs> nobody gets away with what you did Hi, everybody. Congratulations Hello, to all of you on this film. Um, I've seen it twice. It's a, uh, it's a great puzzle box of a movie. I mean, second time even, you get to explore more of the different dimensions of it. But what's so great about the trailer is that we're seeing all these flashes mm -hmm. from the movie, um, little bits and pieces, you know. Can you, because the trailer doesn't really get at plot that much. It gets you want me to explain atmosphere. it a bit? As best as you can. Yeah, well, it's about a woman, Susan, who's played by, beautifully, I think, by Amy Adams, uh, who's living a very empty, hollow life. However, she has every material thing that our culture tells us she should have, and she's trying desperately to be exactly what our culture tells us she should be. Yet, she's quite dead inside. Uh, and she receives out of the blue a manuscript written by her first husband uh, and she starts to read it and it is violent and it's dark and um, do you want me to keep going? We should say just there's one detail that I wanted to tease the audience with. When she receives the manuscript, it draws blood. It does. She, she rips open the paper and there's a prick on her finger, which tells you a bit about yeah, what's to come. That's symbolic. Yes, it is definitely symbolic. So then what is the... Well, uh, uh, her husband is trying to say to her through this book, which is very visceral and quite the opposite. It's set in West Texas uh, with Michael and Aaron um, playing good guy and bad guy. Uh, and and it, he's telling her, this is what you did to me. This is, this is what happened. And uh, I don't want to go too much further. We can, there's another way to, it's easy to explain by saying who plays who. So um, her ex-husband... Her ex-husband is played by Jake Gyllenhaal. Right. Both her ex-husband in real life, and then he has written a somewhat autobiographical novel, and Susan's reading it, and she casts him, of course, as the hero in the novel, um, because he says earlier we find out that no one ever really writes about anyone but themselves. So he plays two roles. Right. Uh, so. and, we, and there's three different sort of narratives. There's, the, there's her, her life as an art. Yep. The, uh, the, well, there's Susan's life in the present, which is very cold, set in Los Angeles, uh, very cold, very empty. Then there is this novel, which is very visceral, which is set in West Texas, totally different world, totally different tone. And then there are the flashbacks the, of Susan's life uh, when she was younger, because this novel starts to make her think about her life with Edward, Tony, um, uh, and, and through reading this, she changes her perception of, of the past. Yeah, and there's actually great other performances. Of course, Michael Shannon plays a, uh, a sort of a justice-seeking cop, Texas cop. Aaron is a psychopath. 
Hard to believe looking at him. When you see this movie, you will be absolutely stunned at the transformation. And there's, you know, parts for, uh, like, little parts for Laura Linney we saw in the trailer. That's not a little part. Well, it's an important part, and she yeah. is incredible. Plays uh, Amy's mom, and also um, Isla Fisher. Now, Amy, do you know why he cast Isla Fisher in this Because film? she's a brilliant actress, and That's he why? knew yes. that she would be able to pull off the tone that was necessary to create the anxiety of, of the scene that is really one of the most anxiety-inducing scenes I've sat through, but I know what you're getting at, so I just kind of bypass that. <laughs> Tom, why don't you but tell it us? is true, you know, Isla, I think, uh, often appears in comedies and we think of her as a comedic actress. She is a terrific, dramatic actress. Uh, she plays, in the inner novel, she's married to Jake's character, and she is, in a sense, a representation of uh, Amy Adams, who was his wife in real life. So, so there, there needed to be a she physical plays, similarity. She plays, like, the idealized version of mm -hmm. me, which is what she sort of is. She you sort know. of is, yeah. She sort of is, yeah. You, you of her. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, people, people have commented on some similarities. Isla and I, every time we get together, we're like, we're nothing alike. We don't even look alike. Like, uh, <laughs> really? So it's, uh, but uh, I know her quite well. She's, she's awesome, and we both have a, a good sense of humor about it. She's hysterically she's funny. She's hysterically funny. Uh, the movie is very funny. That's another thing we should mention. Um, did you know Tom before you uh, first met him for this film? I knew of Tom. I, of warned, course. Warned Tom? I hadn't worn Tom at that point. I'd wanted to. I had like made list of dresses that he had made. But when it's I It's true, uh, we didn't know each other. We didn't know. Which so is odd. I know. So when I did meet him, um, I I got to know him as my director. And it's been strange. I've sort of since we shot the film gone back. I intentionally didn't research anything about him, and I think like about a week ago, I'm like, Tom. I didn't know all about the Gucci period. I was like the last person to know like his whole history. And he's like, mm. Of course I was crushed. No. <laughs> Why? No, it means that I, I loved you because of who you are. I, I was, my respect for you is how, how you conducted you. yourself since I've known you and had nothing to do with your history as a designer and your accomplishments in that world. But really had so much to do with the person I got to know on set. Yeah. Thank you. So, Tom, you have this character, uh, Bobby, who's this gruff, uh, um, very grizzled cop. What, what was it about Michael Shannon that popped into your head when you were thinking of who could play this part? Brilliant actor. You know, I think brilliant actors are a director's safety net. And uh, I don't know which famous director said this. It might have been John Ford that, you know, 70% of your work as a director is, is casting. And... Uh, you cast great actors and you cast the right actors in a role, I just had a feeling he would be absolutely perfect and, and I have to say, exceeded all my hopes. Great. And Thanks, Tom. <laughs> it's true. I was afraid of you on set. Um, <laughs> even though you're the good guy, I was. <laughs> oh, God. Because you stayed in character so much and kept to yourself, which you needed to do, so. Well, he's a great character. He's a... It reminded me of, a, I'm a huge uh, Jim Thompson fan and reading all those books growing up. It just seemed like he was of that, that world. And I just love uh, detectives too, playing detectives, that's fun, yeah. So I mean, you've worked in so many films. What's, what's different about Tom as a director um, versus you know, everybody else you've worked with? What's sort of special about him? Well, Tom, you know, he spent a lot of time putting this together. He put a, uh, put a lot of work into the script, writing the script. Um, and everything is so uh, deeply personal. Like, he's telling this story, even though he's using someone else's novel as a jumping off point, he's also telling the story of himself in a very moving way. And, um, and he oftentimes he says that Susan is kind of a version of himself, but it, it almost feels like every character is is some aspect of him or something he can relate to or something that he's he's dreamed about, you know. And uh, and and his passion and enthusiasm for it really draws you in to the to the project and really makes you want to give him what he's looking for, you know. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've worked with uh, a, a lot of great directors, but uh, I'd work with Tom again any time, yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you up on that. All right, all right. <laughs>
The one we should do Cannonball Run. <laughs> cannonball Run. Yeah, we do a hell of a Cannonball Run, I bet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the one character who maybe you're not, you don't identify with, because I know that you, Michael's right, you can identify with a lot of them, is uh, the one that Aaron plays. Well, you, when you write characters, you do identify with all of them, uh, even if you have to tap into a darker side of your, your personality. So, yeah, you do. You're literally writing their dialogue. So, you know, it's all coming through you in a certain filter. It doesn't mean that I'm a serial killer, but... Uh, Neither am I, by the way. Just so, <laughs> that's straight. But Aaron, have you ever done anything this dark before in your career? Some shoplifting. <laughs> no, just kidding. Oh, he meant as an oh, actor. Real life. <laughs> uh, no, I mean this really was uh, a real opportunity to uh, to to explore and have uh, a real challenge, and uh, I'm grateful for that. And that Tom thought of me for this role. Um, it was uh, really great to collaborate with him and have. Uh, be able to, uh, you know, put the time and focus in and research uh, these characters. I mean, it was it was pretty relentless and um, not very very nice characters. So uh, it was a dark atmosphere. You know, it wasn't easy. And um, you know, Tom's told the story before about uh, you know he knew you and, and knows your wife um, as friends. You were having dinner. Yeah, we were having dinner one night uh, and. Uh, Aaron was telling a story. I couldn't even tell you what it was about because I was busy thinking, I wonder if, and I was watching and listening to everything he was saying and some little thing, it was a glimmer. And I thought, oh my God, he would be so perfect and such an original villain um, because that was also key was to create an original, not just a stereotypical villain. And something you said, Aaron, I don't know, just a little glimmer in, in your eyes. God only knows what I said. I mean, I'm, but I, was I was very perplexed right. when he uh, <laughs> came right. to me for this role. I was like, okay, I'm a father of two daughters, you know, four daughters. I got girls. I'm, you know, this was uh, quite shocking. To but you're also a great actor, so that's well, the key. I appreciate that. But uh, it, it's funny you mentioned that, yeah, we've known each other before this, but I think making this movie, you know, we came, we got, uh, I think, you know, making movies is such an intimate thing. and. The relationships that you build on set, you have to work together and you know, uh, and trust one another. And Tom, you know, in this made me feel very secure. And and in that, we was able to, you know, push the push the boundaries. And um, but I think you know we, I feel our friendship grew a lot more on set and and more so making this film than uh, than the the evenings and the dinners we've had out before. So yeah, I was very that was very a pleasure to do that. Um, I wonder if uh, maybe Tom and Amy can talk about the art in the film. Um, the movie opens with this just extraordinary opening credit sequence that everybody has to see. It's going to be talked about uh, for years, um, which is sort of grounded in uh, modern art or a sort of a perversion maybe of modern art. The film's filled with um, real art. It is. Well, uh, I think when a film is about the art world, I've always personally found it disturbing when the art is fake. It doesn't have the visceral. It, it doesn't have the the quality of, of of art that is truly produced by artists. Not that the people that produce the fake art in films are any, <laughs> anyway. Um, but that's what this is about. You know, this man is speaking to her through a novel, a, a, a work of art, to communicate something. And she is her character as an art dealer. So uh, her life is surrounded by art. And the story is, in a sense, almost a fairy tale. And she visualizes things in the way that she would visualize them, because she is an art dealer. Uh, and, and all of the art that's chosen for the film is symbolic. Uh, we come across a Damien Hirst uh, sculpture with arrows through it, which represents how she's feeling at that moment in her life. There are actually moments where she steps in front of a work of art, and then later as she's reading the novel, we see bits and pieces of that because it's fresh in her, in her mind. Uh, it's hard to explain uh, when the audience hasn't seen it, but right. it, it is interwoven throughout, uh, th throughout the film. But for example, there's a scene where we see what we think is uh, a real um, shot in the film of like a field. Yes. The camera sort of, I don't know if it pulls back. Photographed by Richard Mizrak, who is a terrific uh, artist. And uh, it's in Amy's entry hall in her house, her character's house, Susan. And we just see the image. And then Amy steps into frame. And right. we realize, oh, we're looking at 
uh, a work of art. And then later, when Jake's character does something in particular, which I don't want to give away, uh, I rebuilt that exact same grassy field, and it occurs in it because Amy's character is reading the story, and she has placed it there. Uh, it all must sound very confusing, confusing <laughs> if you haven't seen the film. But well, that's one thing about the movie is it is kind of difficult because of the many layers to it to describe. But when you're watching it, um, it is so fluid, it is so clean, and a thriller, and I hope holds you on the edge yeah. of your seat. Yeah, oh, no, I mean audiences are, are totally charged up when they're, when it's over. You have a connection to the art world in L.A. Um, by way of, I think, your, is your husband an artist? Yeah, my husband's an artist. Was there more than just what Tom provided in the script for you to, um, under, for you to understand that, that whole milieu, that world? Well, it's interesting, because my husband being an artist doesn't necessarily... Um, the world in which he does his art is not necessarily this world of this, like, sort of um, this modern gallerist. Um, so that's a, a world that I've visited, but it's not one that I live in. But what it did help inform is that my husband and I get in conversations all the time, the nature of art and artists, and he considers himself an artist, and I don't consider myself an artist. I'm much more like Susan. When you see the film, you'll know. So a lot of the conversations I have with Jake's character, I've had with my husband, and... Uh, you know, the rest of us consider you an artist. Well, thank you. I'm a craftsperson. Um, but you know what I mean. I think there's a, something inside your soul that makes you say, I'm an artist, you know? And so I'm always like, I'm too cynical, I'm too pragmatic, uh, which is very much like Susan. So really, it was him being an artist and me being me. I just so understood um, where Susan was coming from in, in that place. Yeah. And there's even a scene, Tom, where she criticizes uh, some art. And even though you wrote that line, you kind of almost were hurt by it because it was your art. The, the opening credit sequence. Yeah, yeah, she comments on it. But then again, she's chosen it to, to, to be in her gallery. But it, she's really commenting on uh, the superficiality of contemporary yeah. culture, which is what she's so in dis in disenchanted with, which may sound strange coming from me, someone who certainly contributes uh, to contemporary culture. But perhaps because I'm so immersed in it, I can see the way in which one could get lost uh, in, in con contemporary consumer culture. Well, let me ask you about that, because we've, we've talked before about sort of there, there being a billboard version of you. Yeah. Um, the creative director of Gucci and, and mm -hmm. a very provocative various ad campaigns. This is really, I mean, uh, this is a very ambitious film in addressing that idea of a billboard version of oneself. Which is very much what it's about. Amy's character is living the billboard version of herself, which means that she's basically built a, a, a wall to, to hold in what is actually a very damaged, sensitive uh, woman, sensitive character. I think a lot of us do that. We build a shell uh, to protect ourselves. Uh, I, I think it's actually a, a, a quite a common thing. Yeah. You know? Michael, do you, do you relate to that at all? I mean, uh, you, you seem like a very... I don't, I don't think of there being a billboard version of you, but do you sort of understand what he's talking about, the, the, the shell? Well, yeah, I mean, it's like real weird because I fly a lot, I go to the airport a lot, and I'm always going by the duty-free, and there's my old boss looking at me in his tuxedo <laughs> by the cologne. I'm like, oh, hey, Tom, how you doing? <laughs> it's very surreal. But, uh, you know, like I said earlier, I know from my experience working with Tom what a authentic, uh, down-to-earth individual he is, and, and you know, he spent some of his formative years in this uh, neck of the woods, you know, the Southwest, so he, he, it's not like he's faking it, you know, he knows, he knows about real people and, and real things. Yeah. Aaron, speaking of that, too, like, you know, you're um, obviously British, here playing a, a, not only a Texas murderer, but a West Texas, very specific, you know. How much research went into you um, getting all of the, that right in terms of the dialect and um, just his, his oh, place? Ev everything, you know, that's, that's everything. Um, I had the luxury of having three months prior to making this movie to have that time, and it was precious time. I didn't waste a minute of it, and uh, I was studying uh, serial killers. I was reading uh, about them. I was watching documentaries. Uh, focusing on Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, the Jinx was out at the time. You know, I just wanted to see a through line between any of these guys, and I know that Tom really wanted to create this character to be, 
you know, he's a fictional character and, 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 and there's, in the book, in the story, it's more of a heightened reality. So we was allowed to have kind of uh, be creative and be larger than life and a bit more elaborate and bold. And, and, uh, and Tom wanted this character to be very charismatic and charming, which a lot of these psychopaths had, you know, something that was actually, there was a draw to them. And, um, but then when, when looking closer, there was a lack of empathy. And, uh, you know, my character's totally gone. Yeah. No empathy and, and, and was unpredictable and dangerous, you know, so. Also, if you, if you do a freeze frame of the trailer, you can see that you can see your hand on top of a car. Yeah. Long fingernails. Fingernails, yeah. And what is there on your, <laughs> some sort of a... Uh, so Tom told me, you know, like, um, you, you know, three months, just grow your hair out, grow your beard, fingernails. And... Um, you know, he kind of, and then that's when we started creating, you know, he wanted him to have kind of his, to go into his character, maybe he was a bit of a, thought of himself as a bit of a rock star, so he's got the sort of guitar fingernails, but it's a bit too long, you know, overgrown, and just, you know, this guy makes you sort of, you know, I mean, the sort of stuff that I was accumulating, the sort of knowledge I was immersing myself in was so dark, I was getting well, there's sleepless a, there's nights. A, there's a ring, tell us about the ring on his finger. <clears throat> yeah, no, Sue. So, you know, if you if you watch these guys, um, a lot of these serial killers would have. Oh, some of them would um, keep souvenirs of their previous victims. Uh, would it be like a lock of hair or a, a, a necklace? Or uh, so one of the things my character, when I'm tapping on top, you know, if you notice on my little finger, pinky finger, I've got this uh, little heart-shaped ring, which is like very cheap plastic ring. Probably came from like a you know, a sticker on a magazine, a, ch a children's magazine cover, you know, very, very seedy, very dark. And, um, you know, that was, we talked about this and that was one of Tom's ideas. He said, yeah, actually, I did think about a souvenir. I thought maybe this ring. And it just like, oh, just putting that on every day was just enough for me to kind of Yo, go yeah. in the character, you know, with my hair, my Martin Chot and my voice. And I'd stay in the dialect. Um, I had a great dialect coach, Michael Buster. and. And once they start building these things and you put the green boots on, I'm walking around, I'm feeling like Ray Marcus, and it's, uh, you know, and you're in, you know. Tom, there's also a scene where um, Amy's character is looking at her uh, smartphone, and um, there's a baby monitor, I think. There's a baby monitor, yeah. and all Don't of give us, that away. Yeah, we don't want to um, give that yeah, away. Sorry. No. All right. Yeah. I'm not going to give that away. I just wanted to... Uh, Without giving it away, just to sort of ask. Yeah, basically, you can't say anything, Joe. We just okay. have to chat. Actually, you know what we're going to do? We just need to chat. I'm going to turn it over to the audience okay. to ask right. questions, actually. No They're going to ask questions, and they haven't seen it either. So, yeah. Let's see who has a question. Hi, guys. Um, How are you? I'm good. It's lovely to meet all of you. Um, I'm so impressed by you, Tom. I mean, I was just, you know, you just seem to be a real heart person. What was your... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, schmoozing. Thank you. <clears throat> I just wondered, without being intrusive, what was your upbringing like? What did you... You must have had Oh, I grew amazing... up in a wonderful middle-class yes. Texas family. My parents are both still alive. Uh, my mother lives in California, my father in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and they were the most terrific parents. I was a sensitive kid. I was not the kid who was playing football and, you know, shooting his BB gun. I was home drawing and sketching, and my parents never imposed anything on me except to let me be who I was and to help me fulfill whatever my destiny in life was. So I had a terrific upbringing, and I have a four-year-old son, and for me, that's the same thing. I have no plans for him other than to expose him to everything and, and help him become whoever he is meant to be. It's also worth mentioning that when you, uh, you made a single man in 2009, or it came out in 2009, and uh, I mean, just an extraordinary debut, um, and then thought you would make another film within a year or two, but what happened? I mean, your son... Life takes over. Yeah. My God, where does it go, you know? I, I don't know. Uh, first of all, it takes three years to make a film. If you're a filmmaker, you've got to find the right thing. You've got to write the script. You've got to put it together, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, I wanted to find something that really spoke to me, as, as this, this does. But I also opened 100 stores, had a child, uh, wanted to be there certainly very full on uh, for, uh, you know, hopefully for the rest of my life. But for those first years, very definitely. And uh, life, I don't know, where does it go? Hopefully it will not be 
I'm going to knock on some wood, uh, hopefully every three years, let's say. But it's also men worth mentioning, too, that when you had to fly, you premiered the film at the Venice Film Festival, came to New York for your uh, fall fashion line, flew back to Venice because you won the special jury prize at, at the festival, back to New York, then to Toronto. I mean, you're still juggling both jobs. I am, but you know, when you're excited about what you do, I think it spills over into everything. Yeah. You've visited my editing room, which was in my, uh, in my uh, London design studio. Yeah. So I would edit for four or five hours. I would go out for a fitting. I would go back and edit. I would go back for a fitting. And that collection, which I presented in New York in September, is one of my favorites because I was so happy, you know, uh, and excited. And that just, I think, spills over into life. I think that's the key, is to be excited by what you're doing and to love it. Yeah. Somebody else? Uh, hi, my question is for Amy. Hello. So my roommate's uncle is actually David O. Russell. So I know you love working with him. Um, I just wanted to know what's the difference between working with a seasoned director like David and a newer director like Tom? Uh, first off, David O. Russell is not sort of the person to compare anybody to because <laughs> that's its own thing. So, so I can't even, like, that has nothing to do with being seasoned, being, being not. But, but honestly, once you're on set, it, Tom doesn't feel like this is his second film. It doesn't feel like that at all because of the investment and time uh, he takes, because of his vision, because I think it's what he was born to do. I, I, you never get a sense that, that this is his second film. You, know, you don't feel that he's there to prove anything. You feel that he's there making a film that he feels passionately about. And you know, it's, I was just thinking about this the other day. Most great directors are kind of great directors right out of the box. It's not like they make 10 mediocre movies and then all of a sudden they make a great one. They're like, Eureka, you know? Like, you have to, you kind of have to be good at it right away because you don't get that many chances, you know? Does he do a lot of takes uh, when you're filming? Mm. He's on a, I mean, there's two categories for me. It's like, give me another one or let me go home. And he he would be in the give me another one. But he, 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 he if you asked for another one, he always gave you one. And, um, you know, I mean, what we were trying to get into, the three of us, it was, it kind of benefited to do it more than, than it's once. It's also about really the actor. The Some actors like a lot of takes. Other yeah. actors feel they get they get it quite quickly. Yeah. And again, as a director, I think you have to respect that. So if someone wants another take, great. If, if I think you've got it and you feel you've got it, then great, we've got it. Let's move on. Hi, Tom. Hi. Hi. I love, love, love a single man. So I'm looking forward to, Thank you. to um, this movie. In directing the film, did you have any creative control over the costumes, hair, and makeup? And if so, can we expect Tom Ford's aesthetic? Well, I think you can expect my aesthetic as a filmmaker. Um, it's interesting because after the first movie, A Single Man, if you had said, what's your style as a director? I'm not sure I could have answered that. Looking now at two films, I can start to see my own style, because you don't start out to say, oh, this is going to be my style as a filmmaker. You make choices. Yes, no, I like this, that's not right. And they're intuitive. And then when you look back, you realize, oh, I like heightened reality. I like you know, this type of score. I like that type of score. But uh, no, I, I purposefully put no Tom Ford products in, in this film, um, because it's, it's a different thing. I didn't want it to be a commercial for the fashion side of my life. I uh, worked with a terrific costume designer, Ariane Phillips, who also worked with me on A Single Man. Uh, and and uh, no, Ariane did the, did the costumes, and I thought they were brilliant. As a director, though, of course, you're, you're, you, know, you have a vision for characters, and you work with your actors and, and your entire creative team to uh, you know, uh, form those characters. And, and clothing is a way to help inform the audience about who those people are. Excellent. One more question. Hello. I just wanted to know for each of you, is it hard to distance yourselves from intense characters after filming has wrapped? Yeah, maybe Aaron, you could start with that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like I said it took me three months to kind of almost come to this character or build this character, and I think it probably took me about three months on the way out, you know? Um, I think playing a, uh, staying in that psychological headspace definitely took a toll on my physical self. And um, 
and uh, it, it's intense. It's ingrained. I mean, the sort of the 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 scenes that Jake and I had to go through, and, and my job was to provoke and manipulate him, and and in times we, you know, want to keep it fresh and um, improvise, and and uh, and 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 you know, we we're being pushed to the brink. I mean, we wanted to push ourselves and challenge ourselves. We had a great director to do that, and uh, and I was a sur you know surrounded by great actors, Michael and, and Jake, so, um, but uh, yeah, it takes uh, a little bit of time to start shedding that, that off, it, it, you know. Well, it didn't help that I kept trying to find you. I kept following you around <laughs> the cop car everywhere you were. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, get you. Paranoia. You're going down. <laughs> yeah, well, I did that for about three months, and then I gave the car, the car back, yeah. Uh, Amy, do you want to answer that? I mean, you. I, I wonder if the opposite in a way. Did you have to like de-glam after? I really. She doesn't look de-glam to me. Oh well, not today. But I really, really wanted to maintain Tom's Ford vision of me because I was like, I will never, ever. I mean, he. It's Tom Ford has just basically designed a woman to basically be a version of him. I'm like, I have to maintain this. So it lasted for about three days. Uh, when I realized I had to do it myself without like Tom Ford, it was not going to happen. Um, I'm I'm a lot more casual. However, uh, but I but but shedding a character for me, I I actually do it pretty quickly. I think um, I have a little moment of letting them go. I think I, I had to learn how to do that because um, sort of going through whatever trauma or whatever experience my character had gone through just. It, it didn't work for my life, so I just figured out how to do that. Yeah. I've got to say, uh, you know, it's, it's really, I have uh, a fantastic wife and gorgeous family, and I think, you know, to come home to that and have that keeps me grounded. And, um, and uh, you know, you need that stability and you need that support and love. You know, when you go to somewhere like over here, you, you need to be pulled back and put my feet solid on the ground, you yeah, know. Yeah. So, I, you know, that's what I immerse myself in, back into my family and being a parent. That's and a great point. some characters do stay longer. Some are harder to shed, you know, for sure. Um, listen, guys, it is a dazzling film. Um, it's a shot of adrenaline, I think, in terms of the, the cinematic quality and what it does to an audience, like I was saying. Uh, it opens today. Tom, do you want to tell us where everybody can see it? Uh, today it opens in New York and Los Angeles. It expands on the 23rd of November and then okay. nationwide December 9th. Congratulations, all of you, on this. Thank this you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.